Hey, today we start part seven of the long form teaching series, Rhythms. We're studying God's sovereign strategic plans for the seasons and stages of our lives. Today, we're going to learn about flourishing in summer. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel. This is part seven of the series, Rhythms. If you'd like to hear all the first six parts, click on the playlist and track along from the beginning. And now let's press into part seven. I hope you're encouraged today. I'm going to count to three. You're going to tell me the favorite thing you love to do in summer. Are you ready? Three of you are ready. The rest of you are going, I am not going to answer you, Pastor. Are you ready? Thank you. Okay. One, two, three. I heard beach. That's about all I heard. Um, what do you, so summer is really right around the corner. Um, and, and, and I thought about, you know, a lot of ways to, to get images in front of your face. I'm gonna ask the guys to just start rolling through these images with me. So uh, we get into the water. We love maybe refre- the refreshing aspects of the summer. Just keep going, guys, if you would. The grill, we fire up the grill. We cook the hamburgers and the hot. Baseball, how many of you love baseball? Where are the New York fans? Where are the Boston fans? And they're dwelling together in unity. That's amazing. It's astounding. Uh, we get out to the theme parks. A couple years ago, Ron Habern took me to Six Flags, and Dana and I. Ron um, rides everything at Six Flags, and there was a few rides I just won't even look at at Six Flags. And he's like, "You're a girl." I mean, I just felt like such. I felt like such a baby with Ron. We get out. How many of you love to hike? Pastor Derek is a hiker. He knows all the trails. He's a professional at what Connecticut is all about. Some of you get on the bikes and you're riding, whether on pavement or some of you get out on the water on a boat or a sailboat or something like that. Backyard, just get, getting out in the backyard with a balloon is fun or, or bubbles or cut up watermelon and make fresh uh, water or, you know, whatever your thing is, just hanging out on the back deck or, or whatever. Summer is a lot of fun. It's where we make a lot of good memories. It kind of gives us that long anticipated longer days, more sunshine, more water, more warmth. Um, and it's a It's a lot of fun to uh, enjoy summer. We've been in the series on on rhythms, God's rhythmic work in our lives. We've come through the cold, apparent death of winter, the season of our lives that are hard. We've talked about the spring, the resurgence of life, and and the the blossoming together to, to the life of new energy that comes and the forward hope that all that anticipates. Today we're gonna turn our attention to summer for the next two weeks. What does God have to say about summer? But big picture, just to take you back a couple of weeks, we basically set this up that we wanna savor, we wanna learn uh, to get this season right. Wherever you are right now, you're where God put you, okay? Seasonally speaking, rhythmically speaking, he's doing a work in your life. He's He's writing the master story of your life that folds into his greater story. And a lot of times, I feel like discontentment, I feel like a definition of discontentment could be that I'm in one season, but missing it totally because I wish I was in another. And we're so uh, fast uh, worrying ahead, we're so forward thinking of where we're trying to get to that we really miss where we are. And then it's gone. And we remember it fondly um, but, but if we're not careful, we will forget to really take where we are and focus on savoring this moment. Uh, your, your, your marriage only goes through this season. You'll only be, uh, you'll only be this age right now. Your, your kids will only be this age once. Um, you, you get one pass through your 20s, one pass through your teens, one pass through your 30s and 40s and 50s and so on. You get one, one trip through. And, and, if, and if your trip through your 20s is trying to get to where God's gonna take you anyway in your 30s, you'll miss your 20s. And you get to your 30s and you'll be where you wanted to be in your 20s, but you won't be where you wanna be yet now that you're in your 30s. And you'll just live your whole life from a posture of discontentment, never really dialing in to the blessings of right now and how God is preparing you right now. And that's the real travesty, is how sad to get where God is leading you but not be prepared for it. So many people 
actually arrive at a destination they longed to be at, but they did not get ready for it. They were so busy trying to get there, they didn't get ready for it. They didn't pack a suitcase. They didn't prepare the skills. They didn't take the classes. They didn't read the books. They didn't learn what they needed to know now that they're there. And so there is something very significant about, number one, God works in our lives rhythmically. You'll have many winters, many summers, many springs and falls that come and go in your life throughout the course of following God. And, and those seasons are temporary. You can't really control them or avoid them. Uh, they don't last forever. You come through them. Each of them has a purpose. Each of them has a work to do in them. And by the way, each of them has their, its own um, sense of burden. You'll see that today with summer. So, but God is doing a work in this season that prepares me for the next. So the idea is don't miss it. Listen and look at what God is doing in your life right now and, and rest in that, knowing that he'll take you forward. He'll get you where he wants you to go. He'll take you where he told your heart to desire. He's good at that. So these rhythms of the soul or rhythms of the heart they come and go, and there are these brief stewardships for our lives, and each one folds into this broader and more beautiful and great story that God is writing in our lives. One thing I can tell you about summer, having experienced them in a variety of places, is um, summer has its blessing and its burdens. In fact, summer, in fact, look at Psalm 107. This is where we're gonna start today. We're gonna see many different scriptures where God deals with summer. Uh, this week and next week. Psalm 107 is where we've been spending a lot of time on enough for today the last few weeks. And I couldn't escape the fact that verses 33 through 38 are clearly a reference to a summer season and how God works or what God does in summer seasons. So look at it with me. He turneth the rivers into a wilderness and water springs into dry ground. Now that sounds pretty negative to me. And what that's teaching me, the overarching view of this psalm is God is a God of mercy and delivers us when we cry to him and we call out to him. In whatever trouble or uh, spiritual state we find ourselves, when we lean on him into his mercy, he, cry, he, he answers that cry. But in this passage, God, God says, hey, I can take something that's flourishing with water and life and make it dry and barren. But look at the uh, the next verse kind of builds on that, a fruitful land into barrenness and for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. So there are times where God responds to wicked people and wicked nations and wicked uh, systems and says, I'm gonna dry this up, okay? But look at the next verse, verse 36, verse 35, I'm sorry. He turneth the wilderness, desert, barren, dry, into standing water, still water, Psalm 23, and dry ground into water springs, fresh life, abundance, uh, new life. And by the way, wherever there's water spring, there can be lots of life, which we're gonna see now, verse 36. And there he makes the hungry to dwell. So that becomes home. We, we land there, we plant there, we, we build there, that they may prepare a city for habitation. We flourish there, we multiply there. Uh, God's provision of water and, and fruitfulness makes this able to dwell and multiply in safety and provision, verse 37. And so the fields, we break up the ground and we plant seed and we grow harvest. Plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. So clearly, verses 35 to 38 is a summer season. And you may not be a farmer, in the room, you may have a garden, you may have a, you may have a farm. Most of you are not farmers. So you may uh, wonder, what, what, what does this have to do with me? Sowing fields, planting vineyards, uh, and the fruits increasing and, and multiplying greatly and cattle uh, increasing. What's this all about? Well, in, in an agricultural society, an ancient Hebrew would have read this and seen this as success, abundance, margin, blessing, fruitfulness. That God brings us into seasons of life where the field of our lives, the, the vineyard of our homes and our jobs and our careers and our pursuits, they come to life, they spring to life with fruitfulness in lots of ways and, and with lots of unfolding dynamics and they're blessings from God and he blesses us and he multiplies us and he allows us to see increase. But not all summers are like that. In fact, I've had the privilege to experience two dramatically different kinds of summer. 
There's summer in New England, and then there's summer in the Mojave Desert. And they're very different. Summer, I had 22 summers in the Mojave Desert. And I've had eight summers in New England. So when you're in New England, you think summer, you think, you know, temperatures between 70 and 90 with some outlying weeks maybe, a little bit of humidity, but generally rather pleasant and especially a little further north. You think of everything lush and green and flourishing. You think of rivers. My first season, my first fall in Connecticut, everywhere I drove, I just, I, I just marveled at all the greenery and the ravines and the brooks and the streams and the waterfalls. They're everywhere. You guys have stopped seeing them long ago. I, I'm literally singing over the river and through the woods to grandma. I mean, like, this is where the song was written, clearly. You know, it's just woods and trees and streams and I was just like, everything was breathtaking. Why? Water, life, abundance. Um, but for many years I lived in the Mojave Desert and, and summer there is a blistering experience. It's a barren, dry experience. Nothing grows unless you specifically run pipes to it, set timers and water it you know, abundantly. Um, out in the desert it's coyotes and dead lambs and, and, and rattlesnakes and cactus, sand, tumbleweeds. And you don't wanna get stuck out there in the summer. Uh, in fact, the summer, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to be 105, 110. I mean, that's kind of a normal summer day, mid-June and forward into September, long. And my father-in-law used to make a lot of fun of me because we would talk about how beautiful the evenings were because once the sun sets in the higher desert, you know, 110 becomes a cool 92. And maybe even better, maybe even 75. And the evenings were amazing. But, but here's the, the crazy experience. When we moved to Connecticut, people made fun of us because we stayed indoors all the time. Um, in fact, Mike Berard one day said to me, you don't get out much, do you? <laughs> and I realized I had learned to live inside during all the, the sunny, hot days because this is blistering outside. And in, in New England, it's kind of the opposite. You, you, you're kind of inside during the winter and you don't even want to go inside all summer long. Right, Dave? Stay outside on the mountain all summer long. So it's dramatically different. My point is, summer is either gonna be blissful or blistering. It's gonna be blessed or boiling. It'll either explode in fruit and pleasantness or it will shrivel up uh, in this inescapable heat and dryness. And it kind of depends on where you plant yourself and how you steward the nutrients and the environments that God wants you to be planted in during the summer of your life. God said, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heats, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So what I wanna do in the next few moments is kinda do a flyby, not only of Psalm 107, but of other passages where God talks about summer. And what did he use the idea of summer to represent? What did he, what, what did he point to about our lives when he used the idea of summer as a metaphor or as an illustration? And I, I wanna, give you three words before I jump into the, to the points. You want to write these down in your introduction. When God speaks of summer, it's generally in three primary senses. And we'll unpack this this week and next. But three primary senses. The first is fruitfulness. The second is dryness. And the third is hopefulness. So write those three ideas down. Fruitfulness, dryness, and hopefulness. And let's ask God to lead us forward as we unpack these three thoughts uh, rather briefly. I want you to see, first of all, in summer, God leads us to enjoy summer fruits. To enjoy summer fruits. Now, the Apostle Paul had lots of winter and spring and summer and fall seasons in his ministry. One of the summer seasons of his life was the church at Philippi. One of the summer seasons of his life was his early uh, 18 months at Corinth, uh, where he just saw fruitfulness abound in his life and through his ministry. And he wrote to the church at Philippi and he said um, that it's God that gives us richly all things to enjoy. So like we think of summer as a time when fruit abounds naturally and fully at, at, at a pace that nature kind of drives, so that happens in our hearts and our lives. The, the bitterness and the cold endurance of winter is broken free. 
summer, I'm sorry, spring has flourished to life and, and nourished itself to life in fullness now, and now fruit begins to abound, just like we read in Psalm 107. And it abounds and it multiplies primarily because of the supply of water. You can research the story on your own. Um, there, there's the story of the Los Angeles basin. Los Angeles was not naturally designed to be a good place for a city, especially not a city of, I don't know, the greater Los Angeles area, something like 10 or 12 million people or something ridiculous like that. I mean, you're flying into there, as far as you see north and south is all you can see is homes and cities and, and, and going inland a long ways. It's just a massive, massive empire of population. But the interesting story goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. LA was not uh, a thriving metropolis like New York has been and really couldn't have sustained. But a man by the name of Mulholland kind of got a vision for that whole basin just teeming with life and population. But he knew there was one thing holding it back. All of the ability to sustain the city like God talks about in Psalm 107 and verse 36, they prepare a city. Well, first to have a city, you gotta have water springs. You gotta have water. And he began to realize, if I could just get water into this area, boy, this, this could be a massive region. And so he began to survey and do research, and he had to go as far north as like four or five hour drive, maybe six hour drive, up to what's called the Owens Valley, where there were fresh water rivers coming out of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it's kind of a sad story because he kind of went in there with all the full force of, of wealth and government, and he kind of overtrode or trod over the rights of ranchers and farmers and just tapped into their lifeblood, their water supply, and started draining it down into the LA Basin. He built an aqueduct. In fact, it's kind of a feat of modern human engineering. As they built that aqueduct, they didn't have power to, to pump water. All they could do was use the force of gravity to bring water from the Sierra Nevadas down to the LA Basin. Well, at the northern part of that valley, there's a gigantic peak, uh, well, not a gigantic peak, there's a gigantic water flow at a peak of a crest of a hill, and it kind of goes right, it's right off to the side of, of what is Interstate 5, which runs the, the north and south route out of LA up north. And you can see the water cascading down, and right next to that big, beautiful cascade of water is, is about a 100-year-old valve. It's just sitting off to the side, overgrowing with weeds and stuff. And you can look up the video online. There's a video of Mulholland standing at that valve after he had constructed his aqueduct, opening that valve for the very first time to allow water to flow into that LA basin. He opens it, the water starts to trickle out into the LA area from the Sierra Nevadas, and his famous line was, there it is, take it. And there would be no Los Angeles if there weren't that supply of water coming into that valley. When God brings you into summers, your, his call, his design, his plan is fruitfulness, abundance. He's gonna give you a margin in your life, and it may be um, spiritual and relational and emotional. It, it is also about spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, we'll see that in a minute. But it could also be material in lots of ways. But it's these seasons of life where, where by the touch of God, he's brought you into a season of flourishing. And it's really important that you understand that fruitfulness is from God and that is nourished by God and by his word, by the water of his word, by the water of his presence in your life because without that water, that supply will only become toxic. That abundance, that potential will never fully be realized. Paul described God to the Gentiles in Lystra this way in Acts 14. Listen, he, he's preaching God to people that have all kinds of pagan ideas about him, and this is how he described him. He said, God did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, he gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. That's why I say it's spiritual and material. Food, material, gladness, spiritual. And when God introduces himself to unbelieving people. He says, I'm a God that wants to multiply and make you fruitful and bless you. I'm a provider, a protector, a father. I wanna bring you into summer seasons. In Psalm 107, the psalm is introduced this way. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
when God wanted Hebrew children to learn about who he was in a song. You gotta think of the Psalms like the ABC song is to your English alphabet and learning. You ever thought about how everything you know traces back to one song? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, come on. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S. Very good. Hey, everything you ever learned started, I mean, all the reading, all the classes, all the turning of pages and studying for tests. Imagine if you'd never learned the alphabet. Everything's built on that. And what I'm trying to tell you is that when God introduced himself to humanity and to ancient Hebrews, he used these Psalms to do it. And so picture a five-year-old kindergartner in ancient Hebrew learning who is God? Oh, God, give thanks to him because he's good and he's merciful and life's gonna bring you all kinds of trouble and when it does, cry out to him. Oh, and by the way, you're lost in sin and guilt and shame and you're condemned and you're in danger of condemnation, so cry out to him because he's merciful and his mercy endures forever and you can always turn to him because in the end, he's gonna bring you into summer. He's gonna flourish you and make you Fruitful. That's how God introduces himself to humanity. Galatians 5.22 talks about the work that God wants to do in our lives once his spirit lives in us. And his spirit doesn't live in you until you trust Jesus as Savior. But once you make that decision of faith, Jesus, come into my life, God's spirit takes up residence in your life, and he wants to produce what's called the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22. I want you to read it out loud with me. It's in your outline. Galatians 5.22 through 25. Lift up your voice. I know it's painful to do this work, but do it with me. Ready, go. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. God says, if you will walk in the flow of the water of my word, my Spirit, if you'll abide, like we talked about uh, in spring, if you'll abide in the, in the, in the vine, Nutrients will flow into your life. And what will that produce? It will produce fruitfulness. You will naturally grow the, the fruit of love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance or self control. I wrote down very quickly, I want to point out three qualities of this kind of summer fruitfulness that God says, I'm giving you all things richly to enjoy. So when you come into a summer, and I realize it's a little bit of, might feel like a mockery in the middle of winter to be talking about summer, but it could be received hopefully too. Because you won't forever be in winter. Summer's coming. Hold on, like we sang earlier, wait for him. He will bring you back into summer. There will be harvest. Their joy will return. Peace, love, it will all come flooding back in right time. But three qualities about this summer fruitfulness. First. Plenty of light and warmth produce health. The light of the sun, the water of, of nourishing, the warmth of long days produce good, balanced health. And this is what God wants to do in your life. Can I just comment on the side to say he doesn't expect, he doesn't intend for you to have an eternal winter of soul or heart. Yes, we come through hard things. Yes, we grieve, and grief for a season is a process of working through, and it's, God, it's God's process. But grief segues to summer. Hard, hard winters segue to spring and summer. Now we can choose to sit and pout at the doorway of summer as though we just wanna stay in winter with a martyrdom spirit, but that's not the design of God. And at some point, God's gonna give your heart and your soul permission to dream again, permission to breathe again, Permission to, you're gonna have a resurgence of energy that says, uh, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to follow God in, in a new season of flourishing. And, and, and if you're used to grieving or used to winter, you might even feel guilty about it. But you don't need to. God, when he brings you into summer, is giving you permission to enjoy summer. 
he gives you all things richly to enjoy. Second note I wrote down is that these right conditions produce restful growth and fruit. We don't need to think of the fruit that God wants to bring in our lives as something we work hard at. The work we do is about cultivating. It's not about manufacturing fruit. And there's a difference. You, you do need to be disciplined to be in the word. You need to be disciplined to stay in the flow of God's nourishing of your life so that you steward summer well. You don't have to produce fruit. God does that. God grows the things he wants to grow in your life. And that's, that's um, I, d- dare I say, it's almost easy fruit. It's the fruit that you let God produce. It's the fruit that shows up in your life and others point out, oh, you're, you seem happier than you used to be. You seem more joyful. You seem more forgiving than you. And all of a sudden, you realize others are experiencing a fruit that God is growing in your life. The third con- uh, quality of this fruit is that abundant pleasure grows from the previous season's hardship. So maybe right now you're still in winter and you're still grinding in in patience and hardness and dealing with sorrow and and difficulty. God is deepening and rooting you in a way that is gonna one day soon explode into fruitfulness and you're gonna be able to enjoy the fruit of what you suffered through. So we enjoy, number one assignment, we enjoy summer fruit. Number two, you ready? Still there? Number two, we prevent summer droughts. So there's two senses in scripture where summer turns up pretty negatively, okay? And that is through the images of heat and dryness. Heat and dryness. And so a a little bit metaphorically, but not so much as well, I wanna drive this home in two ways where God mentions summer being eclipsed, summer being lost, Some are being so poorly stewarded by presumptuous, rebellious, defiant, wandering hearts that God actually says, you're not gonna have the summer that I wanted to give you. Uh, And one of them is, in Isaiah, God's warning to Moab. He says, your summer fruits and your harvest are fallen, gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field, and in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting, the treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. In this moment, God is dealing, listen, with people that he has greatly blessed who have forgotten him and taken him for granted and turned away from him and presumed that his blessings are truly their own and the result of their own ingenuity and their own great farming tactics. And they don't need God anymore because they have plenty And here's the danger, friends. Summer is a time of plenty produced by God, but we, the recipients of his blessings, are prone. The gravity of our hearts draws us to love the blessings more than the blesser, to take for granted the abundance and to forget the giver, maybe even to idolize the material provision at the expense of worshiping the one who gave it to us. I remember years ago I had a friend um, that was praying for a big job. This was a big dream of his. He had dreamed of it for a long time. And it was a long journey to get to this opportunity. And I was a member of an adult group and he was a member of the same adult group and as I was attending that group, Every day, every Sunday, we would meet, we would pray together, and then we would study together, and we would share prayer requests in the room. And every Sunday for months, this friend raised his hand and said, I have a prayer request. Pray for me to be able to get this. Uh, and boy, this has happened many times to, to me. I'm sure it has to you. Uh, we want a child. I want a spouse. I want this job. I want this bonus. I want this tax refund. Pray, pray that this will happen. You know, we're, we've all been there. So it's a wonderful thing. Let your requests be made known unto God. Okay, so we, we shouldered this man's burden and this man's dream, and we began to pray together as a group that he would get this job. Every Sunday, for weeks and months, we prayed, 
God, give him that job, give him that job, give him that job. And it was a long process, and every Sunday he'd come in and give us an update. I passed this test. I went through this interview. I, uh, I was approved through this, and my background check, and this and that, and all these things. And it was just all lining up. Every domino was falling. And I'll never forget the Sunday he came in. And he said, hey, guess what, everybody? God answered our prayers. I got the job. Oh, did we celebrate that Sunday. Yay, you, yay, God. Well, God answered our prayers. And can I tell you, sadly, that was like one of the last times I ever saw that guy. It was a total game. And all of a sudden, the job became God. God gave the job. And it was like, he said, okay, thanks, God. And just out. And that, if you're not careful, that's what happens to you in summer. God's given so much. But suddenly the heat of presumption begins to dry out your life, turn you away from all the nourishment of the giver. And if you're not careful, and by the way, this can happen in actual summer too, like June, July, August, it can happen. There's no better time of the year to get away from God and stray from him and make really bad decisions than summertime. And all of a sudden, instead of a time of growth and spiritual flourishing, you come to the end of August and it's like, who is God and where did he go? I left him back in spring. You know, we miss more church. We, we, everything becomes optional and we're out in the sun instead of thanking the maker of the sun and worshiping the God who sustains us all summer long. It doesn't make sense to me how we ask and ask and ask for blessings. We get them and then we forget the blesser, which, which is uh, what I see in the second position here. And I didn't cover my other two warnings. One was to Israel and, and then Jeremiah's lament we'll come back to. But the heat of presumption can also lead to the dryness of forgetfulness. The heat of presumption and the dryness of forgetfulness because it's in times of plenty that we forget who gave us that plenty. Moses warned the Israelites in Deuteronomy, the next generation, going to the promised land. He said, you're gonna go and God's gonna bless you. And he's gonna give you cities and lands and, and he's gonna, you're gonna multiply and increase. And, but don't forget God. And it's exactly what they did. They forgot him. And winter, we generally don't forget God because we cling to him, we need him, we know we need him, we need him in summer too, we just lose the sense of it because we, we have enough, we have plenty. And so we tend to relax our grip on God. We forget who he is. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Here's a man who is scripting out his intentionality not to forget. God, you have lavished me. What has he lavished me with? Who forgiveth all my iniquities, healeth all my diseases, redeemeth my life from destruction, crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. So here's a guy that says, God, you've done amazing things for me. I don't want to forget you. And my desperate cry to you this morning is, in the summer, enjoy the fruit, but don't forget the giver of the fruit. Keep him first. Stay close to him. Stay devoted to him. Don't let the heat of presumption and the dryness of forgetfulness turn your summer into the Mojave Desert that Moab and that Israel experienced because they forgot God. So, first thing we do is we enjoy summer fruits. Second thing we do is we prevent summer droughts. Third thing we do, and I just wanna pause and, and ask you a question. Are you proud of me for being at point number three and it's only 1127? <laughs> I just wanna go on record, like make note, okay? Give me a little credit. Third thing we do is we savor summer hope. Now hang with me, this turns a little different direction here. We savor summer hope. Jesus used the idea of summer to cause us to look forward in anticipation to the arrival of his kingdom, heaven, forever. The eternal summer, the eternal day, the sun never sets, he, he is the sunshine, he is life, he is living water. I mean, it is forever and ever and ever with him. And he used the idea of summer to kind of compare to the arrival of that kingdom. 
Luke 21 is one of several places where he does this, but he said, it says he spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. What's he saying? When you look around planet Earth and you see the conditions and, the, and things unfolding like I've told you, and this was preceding all of this, he's talking about all the end time event conditions, how we know we're getting close. And by the way, we're getting close, okay? Um, he says, you know when you see the trees blossom, you know summer is almost there. And so when you see stuff like this unfolding on planet Earth, you know the kingdom's almost here. Dare I go down this road? There are people in America right now whose hope was so tied to the election or whose hope is so tied to the secular narrative or whose hope is so tied to their hope for temporary uh, social justice, that they're never gonna be at peace. And they have nothing really to look forward to because their team lost, their cause isn't gaining ground, they're whatever. There are Christians in the world radically losing hope because of the condition of society. When actually, if we read scripture, and really follow Jesus, the conditions of our society should be igniting radical joy and hope within us. Because yes, in the last days, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. I mean, God told us this a long time ago. Why are we surprised? A bigger question is why are we trying to preserve a life of brokenness when God may be getting ready to sweep it all aside for the true summer we've all been hoping for. So here it is. God lets the summers of, of our soul and heart now, as they come and go, it's what I put in the subtitle, when life on earth tastes a little like heaven. But here's the danger. Jesus used summer to cause us to look forward, but the more summers you have on your calendar, your record, the more you're tempted to look backward. Okay, so I'm gonna lose a, a few of you that are young, but now that I have a gray beard and I'm so sage and ancient, um, the more summers you have on record and the older you get, here's your temptation, toxic nostalgia. Toxic nostalgia. Hey, remembering is fine. Good memories, good photos. Thank God for all of his blessings. Toxic nostalgia is when you turn backward in a perpetual longing for that youthful summer that's never coming back. And it turns you inward and angry and cynical and grumpy and irritable and sour and you don't even enjoy this summer or any future summer because none of them are as good as how things used to be. And what God wants you to do is realize you have the oldest person in this room, whoever you are. <laughs> Pretty sure it's Brad Schumacher. I'm not sure, I'm not sure, Brad. I just, Brad, I just, I just feel a connection, man. I just feel like, but you know, look how much hair you've got. What happened to me? I just, I said at the church I preached that last week, I wish I could push the nutrition from here to here. <laughs> Brad, you've honed in. You've dialed in on the secret. I don't know who the oldest person in the room is, but I can tell you this. The oldest person in this room has more to look forward to than you have to look back on because of the promise of Jesus. You have more to look forward to. I came across a quote, by, a quote by, da, by Ray Ortland. I'm reading a book by Dane Ortland, and Pastor Ray Ortland is, is the source of this quote. Ray is the, as a pastor of a large church in, in um, Nashville. He just turned 70. 
And I've run across several of his writings that he's musing on age and the passing of life. And he's, I, I imagine he's envisioning handing off his pastorate and sharing the workload and all these things, these transitions that life brings upon us. And he wrote this recently and it just seized me and I copied it. I thought, I'm gonna share this when we get to summer, okay? He said this, as the years rush by, accepting the steady approach of death, not panicking, but deeply accepting the loss of youth, as God's good will for me, I find it relaxing and even joyous. If I'm going to live forever, then getting old is hardly a crisis. I have so much to look forward to. If you're not careful at any age, you can be looking backward more than forward. And what, it's very clear throughout scripture that when Jesus was preparing his followers, he was saying, look forward, look forward. Anticipate what I'm gonna do. Anticipate the eternal summer I'm gonna bring. Anticipate the kingdom I'm going to develop. Be patient unto that long-term fruit. James 5, 7 tells us, Titus 2, looking for that blessed hope. And so I say to you, if you're a believer, enjoy the summer fruit that God brings in summer, Anticipate and celebrate it, flourish in it. Guard yourself. There is some dangers of summer, drought and dryness, forgetfulness, presumption. Don't forget the blesser. We'll talk more next week about the work of summer, really important work of summer. Be more, be more hopeful looking forward, anticipating what's to come than you are nostalgic, toxic, looking backward, grieving the summer's past. And then finally, I want to invite you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ personally as your Savior, then you're in grave danger. God wants to give you an eternal summer. He wants to redeem you. He died on a cross, shed his blood to atone for your sins. If you reject Jesus, there is no eternal flourishing summer awaiting for you. You you will face judgment and wrath and justice on sin like we all deserve. But Jesus died to make a way for you to escape that and to be born again, new life in Jesus. He will come into your life. He will forgive you, save you, change you, guarantee you eternal life in heaven. And that happens the moment in faith, not not that you achieve it or work for it. No, it happens the moment in faith that you receive it. And Jeremiah lamented because God pursued Israel for so many years and they wouldn't have him. And he said, the harvest is past, the summer has ended and we are not saved. And he's mourning and lamenting and what a terrible thing it would be to go through all the summers of life having had your whole life to learn of Jesus, receive Jesus and enjoy life with him and have life end not knowing him and having to reckon with God personally over your sin. Romans 10 says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth, so it's a belief of the heart, unto righteousness, uh, exoneration, forgiveness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How do you get saved? You ask for it. You confess to God that you believe he is the only provision for salvation, Jesus. And then scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall never or not be ashamed, disgrace, put to shame before God. For there's no difference between Jew and Greek. That's, it's for all of us. Salvation's for all of us. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. The God that makes the earth explode with life in the summer is the same God that will make your heart explode with life the moment you put your faith and trust in him. There's nothing quite like the summer seasons of our lives, and they do come and go, and they ebb and flow because that's the nature of the work of God. But isn't it good to flourish in the summer, in the spiritual summertime of our life? But even then, we have to be careful about the drought. I hope today's study has equipped you and blessed you and encouraged you. I hope you'll stick around and subscribe. I hope you'll drop a comment or a question. 
and share this series with someone who can grow and be blessed by it. And I'll see you in part eight.